Amen. Everybody excited to be here this morning? Woohoo! Amen. Well, first of all, um, Pastor Josh is not here this morning, obviously. Him and Pastor Andrew, I mean, <laughs> he and his lovely wife are celebrating their anniversary together. Amen. So isn't it nice that our pastor can take a week off and everything keeps flowing? Because that's the way it should be. Amen. So we're happy and excited for them and hopefully they come home refreshed and, you know, excited and I'm sure they will. Amen. Um, secondly, before I get into the message, uh, uh, if you don't know, uh, we have prophetic arts ministry that goes on during the service. And today, Ms. Barbara painted, well, she's painted two pictures of doors. And she gave me a little note signifying that the, the gold door represented the church, and the, the gold represents the wisdom and success within God's church. But, and, and I just, I, I bring this up because I, you know, this is a prophetic ministry. A prophetic arts ministry. And I just hear the Lord speaking through that, that God's saying that I'm opening a doorway of opportunity for you, my people, in this season. I've got a work for you to do in my kingdom at this time. And I want you to see the opportunities that I'm bringing to you. So open your eyes. Don't allow your eyes to be conformed by the world around you, but open your eyes and see the work that I have for you, and see the opportunity that I, that I have for you. And don't let the situations and circumstances that you currently have to work through, don't let them blind you to the opportunity to, that I have, for I will even work through those circumstances and situations as you adjust your eyesight to see what it is I have for you to do in this season. And i just like to encourage you with that, to... to Open your eyes, because God is moving. He's speaking around us. He's got a work for us to do in this season. Amen? Do we have the PowerPoint? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to give PowerPoint to, uh, to uh, this sermon. I'm going to give it by PowerPoint, so I pray that you will excuse me if I make a mix mistake or few, because this is exactly the, the second time me trying to do this with a sermon. But um, I want to talk to you today briefly about the Army of Joel. It's a, a subject that I'm very excited about bringing to you. And if you have your Bibles, turn to Joel chapter 2, and we're going to read, starting in verse 1, we're going to read all the way down to verse 11. And while you're turning there, I want, I'm going to explain to you briefly what you're seeing here. What that is, that picture behind... The writing there, that is a plague of locusts. And from what I understand, this picture was taken in broad daylight. If you see way at the bottom there, you see the little bit of gold, that's the sun. So the amount of locusts that are in that picture are so great and so, so numerous that they literally blot out the sun. And that's a, a picture of what we're going to talk about today. In Joel chapter 2, verse 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. <clears throat> Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord comes, it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and strong, there has not been ever the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness and will escape them. The appearance of them is the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so they run. Like the noise of chariots on the mountaintops they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devours the stubble, and as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face, the people will be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march everyone on his ways. They shall not break their ranks. 
Neither shall one thrust one another. They will, will walk in his path. When they fall upon the sword, they will not be wounded. They will run to and fro in the city. They will enter the windows like a thief. The earth will quake before them, and the heavens will tremble. The sun and moon shall be dark, and the stars will withdraw their shining. And the Lord will utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very strong. He is great that executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and terrible. Who can abide it? Lord Jesus, I pray that you will add your blessing to the reading of your word. Lord, I pray that your word will come alive within our hearts even today. Lord, and that we will hear what it is you're speaking. Because we know that the Spirit of God is speaking to His church this day. And Lord, I pray that even as you speak to your church, God, your people, your called out assembly, God, that you would awaken giftings within us, that you would awaken talents within us, God, that you would cause us to arise and awaken and be the people of God that we're supposed to be and fulfill the purposes of God that you have for us to fulfill even in this generation. Lord, I thank you, God, for doing that, and I thank you for awakening us, your people, and I thank you for strengthening us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, a locust plague, like the one pictured there, was greatly feared in the Middle East during the time of the prophet Joel. Because these little insects would sweep through and they would devour everything in sight. And when they finished devouring everything in sight, there would be very little left for the people of the land to be able to eat. So when a locust plague came through, the people knew that they were experiencing famine. Joel was an Old Testament prophet, prophesied to the nation of Judah and during the time of the kings of Judah saw in the physical, he saw this army of locusts come through and sweep through the land and just, you know, just literally destroy everything. And he, he stood up as a prophet of God and began to speak about it. And he spoke a message that, you know, a lot of people don't like to hear. He said, God allowed this plague to come through because he's trying to do a work in your life. Many times we don't like to hear that that God would allow something negative or uncomfortable or even painful to come into our lives. But, I, but the reason why he does this is because God is an all-loving God and he loves us passionately with a greater love than any of us have experienced even here on this earth. And why an all-loving God would allow discomfort and pain to sometimes come into our life is because God is far more concerned with our eternal character than he is with our temporary comfort. Many times we value our temporary comfort above our eternal character, but God doesn't. He's a good daddy. He's a good parent. And he sees when we're heading in the wrong direction, and he knows how to correct us and get us back in line and say, hey, I want you to go to the left because you're going to the right, and I don't need you to go to the right. It's not a good way to go through. And unlike our earthly parents who sometimes had to correct us and they really didn't know the whole situation, our God really does know what's best for us. You can, tell, you can trust in this that Daddy does really know what's best. He really, really does. He sees all of eternity. He sees our entire life from beginning to end. And He knows what is best for us. So sometimes when we have to go through discouragement or discomfort or encounter things that we don't like to encounter, we can know that it is a good God in, that is behind all of this. It is bringing about our best. And, I'll, and right now, and I'll explain and expound on this as we go through this, but right now God is speaking to His church and He's even allowing discomfort or, or, things, or things that we have to go through that we don't want to go through to come to His church. Be, and He's not doing it because He doesn't like us or He wants to destroy us. That's not what it's about. But He's doing these things, He's sending these things, and even allowing cataclysmic events to happen in world history because He's trying to bring forth His people. God has a people. 
He, and, and he has a called out assembly called the church, and he is trying to awaken us in this time and this hour so that we will fulfill our death in the earth. God loves you with a passionate love, but just like a good daddy, he doesn't just coddle you in love all the time. He's trying to propel you into your destiny. And he has a work for you to do. He has a, a job for you to do. You, you weren't created to just be to, to just come into the, the church and sit back on a pew and, and pray that the devil doesn't beat you up enough. No, that's not why you're here. But you have been placed in the kingdom just like Esther for such a time as this. And even when you have to be like Esther and stand up in those difficult circumstances, God's got that work for you to do, and he says, I'll be right there with you when you have to stand up. Just don't back down and don't quit in this day because the work that I have for you to do, even if it seems small and insignificant, God says it's not small and insignificant in my sight, and it will do. Gr I'm able to take it and do great things for my kingdom and for my glory if you'll just trust in me. And that's what God wants us to do in this day. He wants us to trust in Him. The prophet Joel stood up and he spoke that message, but he also spoke about a time period called the Day of the Lord. He said, and, and Joel, not unlike other Old Testament prophets, because he's not the old, old Testament prophet who talked about the Day of the Lord, he spoke about events that he was going through, and he used those events to talk about the Day of the Lord. It's sort of like a springboard. He looks, he looks at the event that's going on, and then he says, oh, I see something happening in the day of the Lord in the far-off future that's similar to that event. And that's what Joel sees when he sees this plague of locusts. But first of all, what is the day of the Lord? When the Old Testament prophets saw the day of the Lord, they saw the physical coming of Yahweh. That's what they saw. They saw that God would come to the earth, and he would set all things right. Yes, he would bring judgment, and there would be cataclysmic events. But the end result of the day of the Lord would be restoration in the earth and would be the, the, the expansion of the kingdom of God. What we see here in the 20th century that those Old Testament prophets didn't see was that that day of the Lord was actually at least two separate events. Because we know Jesus has already come, right? God came to the earth in the form of a baby, Right, And he grew up, died on a cross, resurrected from the dead, and ascended back in heaven. And he turned it over to the church. He turned the kingdom work that he started, he turned it over to his people, the church, and he said, I want you to run with this kingdom work that I've given you to do and expand it into every area of the earth. And the early church did just that. They expanded the kingdom of God to every area of the earth, so that the Apostle Paul testified before the ending of his lifetime that the gospel had been preached in every area of the world. But, this, the, but the day of the Lord is actually the time that we are living in. Because it started when Jesus Christ came back the first time. In fact, in Acts 2, 14-18, Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost. Remember that? He stood up on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was being poured out unto all flesh and sons and daughters were prophesying, and he said, this is that which was prophesied in, by the prophet Joel in Joel 2, 28-31. He said, this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel that the Lord would come and he would pour out his Spirit on all flesh. 2, 28-31 is an, a day of the Lord prophecy. That means that we're living in the day of the Lord. Now somebody might say, wait a second, Pastor Andrew. I've read about the day of the Lord, and I know that there are cataclysmic events that have to happen in the day of the Lord, and, and, and there will be restoration happen in the day of the Lord, and, and God will physically come, and He'll set His feet on Mount Zion, and, and it'll split in two. Well, that's true. All those things will happen, but the day of the Lord is not over yet. God, Jesus Christ, is not physically returned yet. He will physically come back to earth. And He will come back for all those who are waiting for Him. But the, the, I have a little bit, bit of a problem. Some people teach this because they sort of teach it like we should be all waiting in a corner, huddled, singing Kumbaya, waiting for Jesus to come back. 
and, and, and hoping that the devil doesn't beat us up too hard before Jesus comes back. Remember the parable of the stewards? Right, the three talents? What did God do to the guy who hid his talent in the earth and did nothing until the return of his master? He didn't get a nice judgment, did he? No, and you, what do you think God expects of us to be doing until he comes back? We need to be occupying. Hmm, occupying until he comes. That's what, in the parable, he said, I want you to occupy until he, not work, but occupy. I want you to take over. I want you to do great and wonderful things in my name. I want you to take those talents and gifts I gave you and use them to my glory. And yeah, it may not always be seem great at first, and yeah, you might have to do simple little things with those talents and gifts before you can get to the great things, but if you'll just trust in me and walk in the path that I've set before you, it will work out all right, because the path of the righteous man is ordered by the Lord. Listen, it's not an accident some of the things that you've had to go through, some of the struggles and the trials that you've had to go through. It's not an accident goes in charge and he has ordered your paths to bring you to an expected end Jeremiah said so we're in the day of the Lord and who is this army that Joel sees because you know Joel sees the plague of locusts in his day and then he looks to the day of the Lord and he sees a people and I know it's a people and not insects because Joel 2 2 says it's a people and that I've looked up that Hebrew word and that Hebrew word literally means people not insects and, and so he sees this great and mighty people taking over everything, invading every area of society. And who are these people that will rise up during the day of the Lord? Well, I, I would submit to you that it's us, that we're the fulfillment of Joel's, we're supposed to be the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. Look at who the church is supposed to be. Jesus in Matthew 16, 18 says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He said, I will build my ecclesia, is the, is the word used there. Because, you know, the church that Jesus is describing, he's not talking about a physical building. And he's not talking about a social club. We're not a physical building, and we're not a social club club. Jesus said, I will build my called out assembly of believers, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, look at the language that he uses. A gate is a defensive instrument. It is designed to prevent people from invading. It's designed to prevent more than one or two people from, because if, if only one person is going to invade your property, you probably don't need a gate or a fence, right? But that's designed to prevent multiple people from invading. Celebrities put gates around their property to prevent armies, media, and other types of people, from invading their property. The enemy has already put up structures in the earth to prevent the invasion of God's army. He's working tirelessly, relentlessly, putting up social structures, putting up... That's why when you try to do things, you have to cut through bureaucracy and red tape. You, you know what I'm talking about? When you have to cut through these... Because there's social structures erected by the government of hell to prevent the onslaught of God's people. And a lot of times, we've got it backwards. We think we're supposed to be in a car somewhere, huddled, reading our Bible, hoping to find so something to get us through and prevent the devil from beating us up. And maybe I can get to church on time and somebody will speak a word into my life that will encourage me and prevent, you know, and prevent the devil from beating up, up on me too hard this next week when I go out. And that's totally the wrong mentality because we're supposed to be an overcoming army taking over every area of the... The devil's supposed to be more afraid of us than we are of him. We've got it backwards sometimes. And guess what? The devil is afraid of us. you got to understand that. Your enemy is afraid of you. That's why he wars so hard in some of the things that you have to go through because there's a scared devil who's afraid that if you'll figure out who you really are in Jesus Christ, and if you'll begin to act like it, the world will be changed. It will be transformed. Look what Paul and them did. When Paul was coming to a city with some of his people, they, were, they said, those people that have turned the world upside down are coming. And that's what the world is supposed to say when they see us coming. We're an overcoming army. 
That's what we're created to be. But our fight as an overcoming army is not a physical one. We don't have sticks or guns or knives or clubs or bombs or whatever else the world uses. That's not our fight. Our fight is not in the physical. But you all know, know the scripture from 2 Corinthians 10? You know, that, that, that the weapons of our warfare are not what? Carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Where are these strongholds at? In our minds and in the minds of others. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God Almighty. Listen, you've got some very powerful weapons in your arsenal. You've got prayer. And when you pray and believe God, things happen and change in the earth. You have power in prayer. You have faith. Through faith in God, mountains, literal physical mountains, can be moved. And you have the Word of God. And so many times we get assaulted with rationalism in our society, we underestimate the power of the Word of God. Because the Word of God not only pierces mind, but it attacks the heart. It is a sharp and two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of bone and marrow and discerns between the thoughts and intents of the heart. Listen, you can, you can debate with somebody using the Word of God. You could even lose the argument. But if you gain their heart, their mind is going to follow her later. And, and, and your, your warfare, when you war with the Word of God on an everyday basis with those who are around you, you don't just overcome the mind, but you overcome the heart. We have that power through the Word of God that has been given to us. We're a mighty army, and, and that is what God has created us to be. That word ecclesia means a called out assembly. So God has called us out of every tribe and tongue and, and nation and people group on the earth. He's called us out. But we're also a governing assembly. That's a government word. That word ecclesia is a word they would use to describe the Roman Senate or the Jewish Sanhedrin or other governing bodies that were elected. God has elected us out of the earth to be a governing body for him, to be spreading the government, the kingdom of God throughout the earth. That's what we're called to do. That's what we're assigned to do. That's why Jesus Christ kept you here on the earth and didn't bring you straight to heaven right after you got saved. Because he's got a work for you to do, to expand the kingdom of God so that he can be glorified in this day and in this hour. So how do locusts, how do we look like locusts? How does it look like us? If Joel looks down the quarters of time and he sees this army of locusts coming, and he's, that's the people of God. That's the people of God. They're doing great and mighty things in the earth. Well, Locusts are a subspecies of grasshopper. They're a type of grasshopper. Of the 20,000 known species of grasshopper on the earth, only about 12 are locusts. And the thing that makes a locust different from other types of grasshopper is that under certain conditions, locusts will swarm. You know, I, the most, I'm sure you're familiar with, with how a grasshopper operates, right? Hops around, keeps to himself, looks for food, protects himself from enemies, right? But when locusts come together and swarm, they swarm in those, those gigantuan swarms that I, I talked to you about, some of which can cover miles, literal miles, hundreds of miles on the earth, and can literally take over an area and within a short period of time can trans form that area. That's a picture of how God wants to use his church at this time in this season is he wants he he is mobilizing an army. God is mobilizing an army and he he wants you to be a part of that army and he is desiring that we use the weapon of warfare to overcome this isn't our time to be discouraged or defeated or downtrodden or beaten up. God wants to raise us up and use us as a mighty army to overcome in this day and in this age. And those small and leaderless, these locusts can quickly mobilize and overcome a territory. Quickly. They, they, when, when, when they start transforming, because it's an amazing transformation that happens to the locusts. When they're brought together, and this is a vital key, when the locusts are brought together with each other in close proximity, that's when the transformation happens. That's when they begin to stop thinking 
in, in a solitary mode and start thinking in a, in a swarming type of mode. This transformation is, so, is such a difference. It's like a Jekyll and Hyde transformation. They, 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 they transform and, and they stop acting like a little solitary grasshopper and they start acting like a swarming locust. And those are the two different modes. Uh, I, won't, I, I won't give you the scientific names for those modes. But we'll call them solitary mode, which is individualistic, where the locusts keep to themselves, act like grasshoppers. And the swarming mode, where they move to, in this incredible swarm to quickly take over a region. And the transformation is incredible. One of the first things that changes when they transform is their color. When they're in solitary mode, they're camouflaged. They blend in with their surroundings. Sort of like some Christians, you know, who blend in with their surroundings and don't make a difference in this world, they don't make any waves, you know, they, they, they hide. But why do, animals, why do animals blend in with surroundings? To protect themselves, right? And, and that's why the solitary locust blends in with his, his surroundings because alone by his himself he doesn't have very much defense but when they swarm the color changes and they stand out from their surroundings and and they're not worried about defending themselves against enemies anymore because now all of the sudden they're the aggressor and they're the one that their enemies are afraid of look at the elephant in that picture can you even see him that, that, that guy is being overcome by a swarm of locusts. And what defense does he have against those locusts? He doesn't have, have one. Any. What's he going to do? Run? Is he going to try to fight the locusts? He might stomp a few of them. The enemy, the locusts, might be able to stomp a few of them, but they're quickly overcome by the rest of the army. That's what God sees when he sees his people at this time and this hour. We, we see ourselves as the insignificant little solitary locust. Oh, I'm just taking care of this and that. And I'm, 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 you know, and I'm just keeping to myself and I'm just taking care of my own needs. But God's like, I'm putting you with people in the body. I'm play, I've got a place for you in the body. And, and I've got put you in that place because I want you to interact with, the, with other people around you. And when you do to begin to create something within you that, that, that couldn't happen if, if you and other people were kept separate. Listen, this is why Pastor Josh believes so strongly in us connecting with other churches. Because he knows that by ourselves, we're not able to do nowhere near as much as we can if we connect with churches like Audacity or other or Man or Covenant Lover or or True Vine, who were going over and being a part of their prayer. We can do more with each other than we can by ourselves. There's no, there's no Rambos in the, in the body of Christ out there with their machine gun taking down all the bad guys by themselves. No, God is raising up an overcoming army at this time. That's what He wants us to be. That's what He sees us being. And when we come together, we will transform just like the locusts do. Our focus changes, and we're not thinking about ourselves anymore, but we're thinking about the needs of others. One of the quick, quickest ways to, to, to um, overcome in an area of sin or temptation is to get involved in the body of Christ. Because it will get your mind off your problems, and you'll begin to, to, to be focused on giving rather than and you begin to you know, you'll get in and you'll find yourself a part of something bigger than it's yourself than yourself and you'll find yourself overcoming god wants to connect us it's the enemy that tries to drive us apart we're one body listen we may be a whole bunch of different churches we might meet under a whole bunch of different banners and, and different denominations but we're one body we're one people and there's there's no division in the body of christ there is, there's no color line, there's no ethnic line, there's no, there's no religious line, there, there's no social status line. We're one body, we're one people. Behavior, when, when, the, when the locust changes, his behavior changes, like I said. He's not influenced by the surroundings as much, but he influences the surroundings. Are you influencing your surroundings or are your surroundings influencing you? When, when, but, when, but see, when we get together with other believers, 
When we get together with other believers, that transformation happens. And when we go back to our job or, or, or our work or, or whatever area of life it is, we begin to take on that attitude of the transformed locust and we begin to influence our job. We begin to influence our, 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 our workplace or, or, or our school, wherever it is we spend our day. Because, listen, there are seven areas of society that God wants us to transform for His glory, wants the kingdom of God to take over. And the church, for too long, has only been concerned with the religious mountain. But, but there's also the area of business and media and the arts and education and government. Can you imagine what would happen if God's people in mass invaded from within, not from without, but from within, invaded Washington, D.C.? Or invaded Hollywood? This is God's desire is for His kingdom. It's world transformation. He doesn't just want a few people here or there. He wants the world. And this is what the devil fights so hard to prevent. Like I said, I don't... I used to believe that the enemy was when the biggest thing he was worried about was people getting saved. And I'm I know he's concerned about that. He doesn't want people to get saved. But I think, and I might be wrong, but I think that Satan will allow a few salvations here or there as long as he can keep the army from being mobilized. Because if we mobilize, we have much more power together than we do apart. And, and yes, our focus will change, but look at that thing about reproduction. When the locusts are in solitary mode, they reproduce at a very, very slow rate. Sort of sounds like the church, right? When the locusts swarm, they reproduce exponentially. That's how you can end up with a swarm of locusts that's hundreds of miles long. This is what God desires for His people in this time and in this hour. He wants to get our focus off ourselves and our own needs and get us connected with each other so that we'll begin to be transformed by the Word of God. You know, Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind that you might be able to prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He wants us to be transformed so that we'll take over. And so that the world can come to know the glory of God. And you might say, well, Pastor Andrew, I've not seen anything like what you're describing existing in the church. And you're right, because the church has fallen away from what we're supposed to be. For a thousand years, the Apostle Paul prophesied that there would be a great falling away. And a thousand years it happened, because during the Middle Ages, the church experientially rejected every fundamental principle of the doctrine of Christ, as outlined in, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. These are the basic doctrines of faith in Jesus Christ. But God did not leave the church alone. And through, starting with Martin Luther in the 1500s, he began to restore the church. He restored the doctrine of repentance from dead works through Martin Luther and others in the 1500s. Through John Wesley and others like him, he restored the doctrine of faith towards God in the 17 to early 1800s. Through William Seymour, anybody ever heard of the Azusa Street Mission? Amen. A revival that went nonstop for three, three years, day and night. But the importance, was, it wasn't the revival, the importance was is that it restored the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit as evidenced by speaking in other tongues to the church on a wide-scale experiential basis. And that's exactly what it did. It was, it was restored to the church. Now we're not a church that just flows in the natural, but we flow in the supernatural. And God has spent most of the 20th century, that, that fourth one is not faith towards God, but it's laying out of hands, restoring, restoring the supernatural to His church. Restoring the gifts, restoring the offices. You know, when we entered the 20th century, the five-fold ministry was not in wide-scale operation. It wasn't. But over a period of 50 years, devoting 10 years to each ministry, God restored the five-fold ministry. He restored the prophet, the apostle, the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist. Well, he mostly the apostle and prophet because 
The pastor, teacher, and evangelist were already in operation. He just expanded their, uh, their ministry. But he's got all of the five-fold ministry in place. He spent all of this work restoring his, all these fundamental principles to his church, bringing us back to where we're supposed to be. What, what is the purpose of the five-fold ministry? Y'all remember that? To equip the saints, the believers, to do the work of the ministry. So who are the primary ministers in the body of Christ? We are. All of us believe, you believe in Jesus Christ, you're a minister. God has ordained you as a minister. That means you can lead other people to Christ. You can baptize them in water. You don't have to get Pastor Josh or myself or Pastor Gabe or someone else to do it. You can do it. You're a primary minister. And that means the primary place of ministry is not in these four walls, but out there. Keep that in mind when you pass that sign as you leave today that says you are now entering the mission field. You are. There's people out there that need what you have. There's, there's people out there that if you don't tell the gospel to them, they may never hear it. You might be the only Bible that they ever read. And God has, is equipping, has equipped you. It's no accident that you're here in church today. It's no accident that you're here at this place in time because God has equipped you to be part of his army. He's awakening the gifts and talents that are inside you so that you can rise up at this time, at this, at this hour, and be part of his army and invade every area of society. And the locusts, when they invade an area, they don't just invade it from without, but they invade it, I think I alluded to this, they invade it from within. They invade a house. They'll get into everything, into the cupboards, into, into every dish, into, into everything. I mean, think about the infestation of um, roach, cockroaches that you can think about. It has nothing on this. The, the locusts invade all of that, and they consume, and they keep moving. The next major event on God's timetable, and we actually have already enter, entered into it, is resurrection of the dead. He's restoring that doctrine to his church because God is waking up an army. God is waking up an army. He is, he is determined at this time and this season to wake up his people so that we will be the primary ministers in the church and do the works of the, of the fivefold ministry. Pastor Benny Hinn is, is an awesome minister and has an awesome uh, healing ministry that goes forth from him. And there's a lot of attacks on that man's life. He has to endure a lot of things for the gospel. And the enemy would love to take him out because he believes he would take out a significant portion of that ministry with it. I, I, some of you all who have been in the body of Christ for a while and have seen um, different leaders rise up in the body of Christ and yet and they, they get taken out. They fall into sin or whatever happens to them. And a great portion is taken up, is taken away with them. But what does Satan do when there's an army of Benny Hens? When every person, every believer in the body of Christ is doing the works of Benny and even more. How can he stop? He can stop one of us, but how can he stop us all? This is the power that the church, the ecclesia, the called out assembly of God has. And it's the power that God is trying to awaken. This is what Joel saw about the people of God. He said, listen, they're going to arise during a time causing a fear and apparent, apparent fear and uncertainty. I'm going to tell you it's time for the church to stop quaking in fear every time some significant event happens in world history. It's time for us to stop to stop being like King Ahaz and being moved every time there's a little shaking in Israel or over there. And, and sometimes, I don't know if I love it or hate it, I, but, but I hear people say, oh no, something happened in Israel that God is, is coming back soon. Well, yeah, he is coming back soon. But they almost say it as if they need to run to their corner and hide and wait for him to come back. And that's not why Jesus is coming back. He's coming back to, a, to an overcoming army. He's not coming back to a, a people in here in a corner somewhere. He's coming back to a people who are overcoming and doing the works of the kingdom. This army is like unlike anything the world has ever seen. 
That, that, that is another scripture that lets me know. This isn't locusts he's talking about. He's talking about an army. Because he says, like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was of old, neither nor ever will be in ages to come. This is our time. This is the time of the ecclesia, the called out assembly, the church. It's our time to take over. It's not our time to sit back in fear. Young people, this is your time. It's your hour. It's your day. People with have a little, just older youth. Amen. This is your day. Your age hasn't passed you by. Your day hasn't passed you by yet. You still have breath in your mouth. And as long as you have breath in your mouth, there is hope and God has a work for you to do. He's not called you to sit in a nursing home somewhere saying, Jesus Christ is going to take me. Well, bless God, I want to die with my boots. If Jesus comes back for me, however he chooses to take me, I want him to find me working for the kingdom. They bring world transformation on an unprecedented scale. This is the power the church has. We have the power to invade every area of society, to take it over and to transform it for the glory of God. And listen, when I start talking like this, sometimes we, get, we, we start to think out there in the, in the big, you know, oh, this big army sweeping through, and let, let's go do a prayer walk. And, and I'm excited about the prayer walk. Don't get me wrong. But, but a lot of times the acts that we do are in the little things. The little things, just like saying hello to the cashier who at Walmart who scowls at you and acts like you're doing her a favor by coming through her line. <laughs> by, by just speaking blessing, by speaking life, every word that you do, every action that you do, it can either help mobilize the army or it can help demobilize the army. Because those locusts that I describe that transformation is incredible but you know what happens to those locusts if you get them away from other locusts they start to transform back into a solitary locust a locust can go its entire life and never transform into a swarming locust it can also go its whole life and never transform back into a solitary locust the choice is ours are we going to be the the, the mighty overcoming people who will who will take this land or are we going to be the ones who say well I'm just one person. What can I do? One, all it takes is one person. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he was one person. But wow, what did he do? You know, the guy he was named after, Martin Luther, he was just one person. Nailed those 95 theses on, on the door of Wittenberg Cathedral and changed the world. One person can change the world. And listen, it isn't so much about what you can do. It's about what God can do through you. Don't forget the real power of this army is not in our numbers, but the real power of this army is the God who utters his voice before the army and directs us. With, through the power of the Holy Spirit, there is nothing that can stop us. They move and cooperate together in such a way as to appear to be a well-disciplined army. This next one's the one that gets us. They do not fight each other or get in each other's way. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Too many times we forget your enemy is not your brother and sister. Your enemy is the devil. And your enemy is not the unbeliever at, the, at your job, even though the devil is empowering him to act like your enemy. He's not your enemy. Your enemy is, the, is Satan and his cohort of demons. That's who your enemy is. And, and God wants to use you to reach people. Each person moves straight ahead and sticks to their assigned area. Not only does each person stay in their lane, but they cooperate in their common mission and work together. And I like this, this last one here. No obstacle placed in their path stops them or even slows them down. They easily overcome every defense. Together we are an unstoppable army. There's nothing that can, that, that can get on our way. God has created you to be part of that unstoppable army. And you have brothers and sisters here and around the world, and we're praying for each other, believing for each other, standing in faith for each other. 
We cannot be stopped if we stick together. They take over and invade areas of life and civilization and transform it to God's glory. I like this last one. They are totally obedient to their true leader, God himself. The Lord utters thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond the number. And mighty are those who obey his command. The day of the Lord is great and it is dreadful. It's God who stands and directs his army. It's God who stands and directs you and you begin to connect with other believers in your workplace and begin to see it. Because God wants to see your workplace transformed. Do you know who the other believers are in your workplace or at your school? Are you praying for them? Are you believing with them? Are you talking to them? One of the biggest things is when we just get together and talk. Because you all, you all know how it is. You get together with another believer or who, who thinks like you do, and you just you, you start talking with them, and something starts happening. You know what I mean? And that's, a, that, that's that synergy that starts happening wants to use to transform the world. And we can't get so wrapped up about our brother or sister who doesn't believe exactly the same way that, that we, we believe. Listen, you believe Jesus Christ is Lord. You believe that he's God and, and died on the cross and rose from the dead. Hey, that's all I need. We can work together and we can accomplish great things for the kingdom of God. Amen. That's all we need to work together. We'll work, work on the rest of it when we get to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> because the time truly is short. We're, we're moving through our lives at a rapid pace. He's got a work for us to do, and he does not want us to miss out on that work for us to do. And the enemy is so busy making distractions, causing distractions, causing hindrances, so we'll get our focus, our eyes off the prize. It's like Hebrews 12 says, Therefore putting behind me the things you know, which hindered me, I press forward toward the mark of the high prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I don't have time to get tripped up in, on everybody's opinion of me or, or worried about the brother who is mad at me or worry, well, pray for him, I love him. You know, I don't, don't have time to worry about everybody else's opinion on Facebook. You know, I don't have time to worry about these things. I've, I've got a work to do in the kingdom. And I want my master to, when, when, when I finally show up and look Jesus eyeball to eyeball, I want my master to be able to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I'm going to read this prophecy toward you. And, and I want you to, I, I just want you to hear the words of this prophet. It was spoken by a prophet by the name of Mary Baxter. Um, she wrote a couple books. You can Google her, find out about her. But just listen to the word, words of this prophecy. Behold, I am preparing a holy army. They will do mighty exploits for me and destroy your high places. They are an army of holy men and women, boys and girls. They have been anointed to preach the true gospel, to lay the sick and to call the sinner to repentance. This is an army of working men, housewives, single women, single men, and school children. They are common people, for not many mo noble have responded to my call. In the past, they have been misunderstood and mistreated, abused and rejected. But I have blessed them with boldness and holiness and in spirit. They will begin to fulfill my prophecy and do my will. I will walk in them, talk in them, and work in them. These are they who have turned to me with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. This army will awaken many to righteousness and purity of spirit. I will soon begin to move upon them to choose from my army those I desire. I will search for them in the cities and in the, in the towns. Many will be surprised at those who I have chosen. You will see them begin to move across the land and do exploits for my name's sake. Watch and see my power at work. This army which was spoken of by the prophet Joel will arise from the land and do great works for God. The son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. He shall tread down the soles of the wicked and they shall be ashes under the soles of his feet. They shall be called the army of the Lord. I will give gifts unto them and they will accomplish mighty works. They will do exploits for the Lord of glory. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. This army shall fight against the forces of evil and destroy Satan's work. They will win many to Jesus Christ before the day of the evil beast arises. I don't know what you think you are or who you think you are, but I can guarantee you that God thinks greater of you than what you think you are. Well, let's everybody to stand up, if you would, please. And just as you close your head and you, 
I mean, you bow your head and close your eyes with nobody looking around. I want you to think about a few of the things that I've been speaking today. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as that transformed locust, that mighty overcomer who's going forth and, and, and working with other people of God and doing great works for his kingdom? Or do you see yourself as that solitary locust who's just keeping to himself and not really doing that much for the kingdom? How do you see yourself? Do you see the works that you're doing as insignificant or significant? No work that's done cause of Jesus Christ simply for the desire to bring Him glory is worthless. And God takes the little things, the small things, the weak things of this world, and He confounds the wise with them. The works that you do for the kingdom, they're not in vain. In fact, you may be doing more good than what you realize. But just let the Holy Spirit breathe on you. You know, in the valley of dry bones, the Ezekiel looked and he saw a great many bones that were scattered and dry. And God asked him, he said, can these bones live? And that is the question before the church right now, today in this hour. Can the people of God mobilize into that great and powerful army? But yet the, the prophet stood and he spoke the word of God. And the bones came together. And the people mobilized into a great and mighty army. And then the breath of God came from the four winds and breathe new life into that which is dead. Right now, position yourself to receive from God because He's right now, he, the wind of the Holy Spirit is moving through this place right now. He's touching lives and He's breathing upon that which is dead. Dreams and desires that God has placed in your heart, they're for this time, they're for this season. You have a gift to give to the body of Christ. You have a work to do. And God's calling it out of you right now. He's calling it out of you. He's saying, I want you to be a part of my mighty army. As I'm continually mobilizing my people. I've started to mobilize, yes. But I'm mobilizing my people. And I want you to be part of that army. And all I really need you to do is say yes. Just say yes. Just say yes. Just say yes. Mm.